Hey, everybody. Welcome into the podcast. We're back with another special bonus episode. Bonus episode. We are so excited to be bringing to you today Josh Larson as our interview guest. Josh is the co-host of the incredibly popular radio show and podcast Film Spotting, where he's been since 2012. And since 2011, he's been the editor and film critic at Think Christian. He's also authored the book Movies Are Prayers with InterVarsity Press, and we're going to talk about that book with him today. Josh has been writing and speaking about movies professionally for 25 years. Josh, how are you today? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me on the show. I don't know how effective the whiskey angle of your show is for getting guests, but it worked on me, and so here I am. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all we had to do to entice you. I really like that. <laughs> yeah, honestly, Bob and I started this podcast with the simple idea of like, we like drinking whiskey and watching movies, so we should probably talk about both of those things. Yeah, there you go. So Josh is a film critic based out of the Chicago area, and we are actually just going full on Chicago today. I know that the Cubs did not make the postseason, but we're just going to lean into the Chicago aspect of things. We are sipping on Few Bourbon today. Few is a company that's based out of Evanston, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. Uh, Josh, have you ever had anything from the Few line before? As a matter of fact, I have. I'm probably, I would say I'd rank gin and above whiskey for me personally. Sure. And I received, it may have been Christmas last year, maybe it was for my birthday, but my sister got me some few breakfast gin, which used some bergamot, like what's in Earl Grey tea. Oh, sure. It is almost too good. Uh, it, wow. it, didn't, it didn't last long. Absolutely <laughs> delicious. And yes, so that was my experience with Few. I was very impressed and very excited that I was going to get to try the uh, the bourbon whiskey that you guys sent. I think it's really smart marketing that they call it breakfast gin because I was just under the impression that breakfast gin is any gin you drink before 10 o'clock in the morning. So. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, yeah, mostly alcohol is known for being drank at lunch and or dinner. So you might as well reach into the untapped market that is the <laughs> breakfast drinkers. They, they saw an angle there. That's right. <laughs> well, Josh, we are so excited to talk to you today. And just to get started here, I, I want to talk to you about what it's like to be you know, a professional film critic in 2019. And I guess that's kind of my first question to you is, is what does it mean to have the title of film critic, you know, in, in 2019, where that has kind of become so, you know, democratized? Yeah, it's dizzying for sure. Um, being someone who's been doing this for, as you said, a number of years now, a dizzying and exciting and in a really good place. Uh, I'll say it's in a really good place in terms of, exactly the democracy aspect you mentioned. We have so many different voices and people coming at films from different perspectives that is hugely exciting. Um, professionally, it's probably not as in as great of a place and that's just part of the way new media has completely altered the landscape. It was very difficult to get work as a film critic when I started in the late 90s. And my perception is that it's even more difficult now. And I don't, it's not even really my full-time gig. I, as you said, I do film spotting on the side, um, which involves a lot of film criticism. Essentially, that's, that's what it is, film criticism. I get to do film criticism as part of my day job as editor at Think Christian, which you mentioned. And we also have a podcast now where we talk about movies. But you know, gone are the days where all I do is write or talk about movies. It's one part of the other things I do because it's it's rare these days to have that position. I only held it myself for about seven years in the 2000s as film critic for the Naperville Sun, where all I was doing was writing about movies. And then as newspapers declined and the media landscape splintered, you know, those jobs are, are even harder to find. But the good news is there are more people doing the craft, and that's absolutely exciting. So, yeah, I guess that was my follow up was, do you see that as kind of an opportunity for more people to be talking about film? Or is it difficult when you, you know, when you're kind of competing for space when anybody that has a YouTube account now can kind of call themselves a film critic? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to blame the opening up of the voices on the reason that established media has started to falter. I don't think it's that sort of correlation. 
And, you know, any day of the week, I'd, I'd rather have an outlet for multiple people from different bra- backgrounds and experiences to talk about film than to have sort of the, you know, the white tower of just the few who come down and pronounce what is good and what is bad in movies. Yeah. Um, so, so I think, you know, the discourse is in a better place and, you know, it's up to, it's what you want to get out of it. Do you want to be part of that discourse? Are you doing this as um, because you find fulfillment in it, or are you doing it because you want a certain number of followers on Twitter or whatever? I, I, I think if that's your main goal, you're probably never going to be satisfied. Hmm. Um, but if you're in it again to talk about movies passionately with people who also love them, it's a great thing to have these many other avenues to do that and to be able to find more community to do that with. Um, that's definitely been a plus. Yeah, Josh, it's amazing that you bring that up because literally at the start at the start of this interview, it kind of went to a dark place really quickly of like, yeah, newspapers are going downhill and <laughs> there's not normal things. And I appreciate the the freshness of your take that like, yeah, th- these things might be changing, but change does not necessarily mean that it's a bad thing. You know, we have opportunities to engage with so many more people now, and I think it's wonderful that you have that attitude as a professional film critic. And maybe it's easier for me because I did find a place to land doing new media at Think Christian. You know, I might feel differently if I was still hanging on at a newspaper and my job was on the cutting line. (laughs) That happened, you know, those days are behind me. So it's maybe easier to have that perspective. I certainly have sympathy for those still working at newspapers or in digital media, too. I mean, you'll hear about websites doing great work for a couple of years and then shutting down because they just can't make it. And those people looking for work. So it's a really difficult time. I don't want to downplay that, but there, there are still benefits to that uh, democracy angle. I want to, I want to kind of ask about, you know, what it's like to be interacting with the public so much, you know, having a podcast, being really active on Letterboxd, because I do think that there is still this perception that film critics are, you know, what, however you want to phrase it, out of touch with the the public or something like that. I've heard a lot of complaints lately, especially about the way that critics reacted to the film Joker. It premiered at Venice and a really small group of people had kind of decided what to th- what to make of the movie before the general public even got a chance to look at it. So how do you fight that perception that, you know, critics are out of touch with the public or how do you open it up that critics can have more of a conversation with the public? I think I've been really fortunate in that the vast majority of my interactions, you know, online or feedback to the to film spotting or even through Think Christian and on Letterbox as you say have been fairly reasonable, (laughs) which is not the norm I gather from the way I see other people uh, on film Twitter and so forth, really having a difficult time uh, with people who come at them. I I wonder, I'm, I'm probably at, you know, a very low level of notoriety where I'm just not attracting the attention of the, of that segment of the online discourse. And I'm, I'm happy with that. I would rather have, you know, being in these circles that I do interact with where it's definitely listeners, readers, what have you, pushing back on my opinions often, but doing it in a way that I think film spotting has modeled for many years. And, you know, from the very start, and I wasn't around, I joined the show in 2012, and it had been around since 2005. Adam Kepinar and Sam Van Hogren, who founded the show, they were very intent on involving the reactions of the listeners and seeing this as a community that they were a part of. And so that sort of back and forth discourse, I think, has really set a nice model where um, I've been able to benefit from that in that those those listeners have really been interested in some, you know, tough back and forth, but nothing that becomes as vitriolic as as what I hear about and sometimes see online. That's really encouraging. And one of the things that I've really, really appreciated about kind of the things you do outside of film spotting that interact with the public is the last couple of years you have led the Ebert Interruptus. And you know, for a film nerd like me, that is such an exciting thing just in general. But can you talk to our listeners a little bit about the idea behind Ebert Interruptus and your involvement with it? 
For sure. Yeah, I was just uh, emailing someone this morning, actually, as we're trying to nail down what next spring's title will be. This is every April. It's part of the Conference on World Affairs. And it's an absolutely unique viewing experience that Roger Ebert started. This is going to be the 45th anniversary of Ebert Interruptus. So he started it way back when, where he would screen a film. The conference itself goes over, it goes about a week. So he would screen a film in its entirety day one. And then people would come back the next day. And over the course of four days, They would watch it and stop it whenever someone had an observation to make or a question to pose. Ebert would jump in with comments as well. And essentially, it would be watching a movie, in some cases, frame by frame. Um, And so he did this for many, many years. And after his death, they did keep it going. They brought in a different critic for a couple of years each And then they invited me to attend about uh, three years ago. I've done it three years now and lead that. And I had heard about this over the years when Ebert would write about it. Like you, I always wanted to go uh, and just couldn't make it out there. This is, I should say, at the University of Colorado Boulder. And boy, when I I got that email, if I would be interested, it it was... kind of blew my mind and it has been a joy to lead. And so, yeah, we're going to do it again this coming April, as I said, still trying to narrow down the title. We've tried to bring, since I've been doing it, a little bit of a different approach rather than the canonical films that uh, Ebert would always do. I started with Rushmore, the Wes Anderson film. Oh, that's Um, awesome. And we've also done Mad Max Fury Road. And last year we did WALL-E. So those are all genres that in the past Ebert Interruptus hadn't really explored. So it's been interesting to, to do that. And yeah, we've got some exciting possibilities for this year that I'm not going to throw out there yet until we, until we settle on the title. Well, and even right there, I think you see what Bob was talking about, a film critic who's trying to connect with the general public in ways by watching movies that the general public was a big fan of. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, I kind of always consider myself a populist. I grew up, maybe that's part of being raised on film in the Lucas Spielberg era, where there was never really this hard of a divide between pop art and art. And so though I've grown in my film education, certainly, and my taste has become more esoteric in a lot of ways, and there are definitely like the slow cinema or foreign language cinema that I absolutely love, I haven't, you know, thrown that other stuff out. And so it is one thing we've been trying to do with the recent Interruptus titles is to widen that tent a little bit and say, um, hey, if you're a fan of these mainstream films, let's get together and and talk about, uh, really look closely at their artistry. And, you know, for some people that might be a gateway to broadening their own cinema horizons. Yeah, well, speaking of taste, you know, and broadening our horizons, (laughs) this isn't just the film podcast. This is the Film and Whiskey podcast. So Josh, we were, you know, lucky enough to get this few bourbon over to you and we would love to try it with you and let you know let us know what you think about this. Sounds great. All right, so first thing we're going to do is, you know, Brad and I have poured this bourbon out already. So we're going to just kind of nose it and see what we can smell on it. Now, few has on the label it says that it is aged for a minimum of 1 year. And what we find with a lot of bourbons is that the general minimum that they like to have is 2 years. So this is what we would call a really young whiskey. Uh Brad, what are you picking up on the nose of this? Honestly, I feel like I'm getting something of a black cherry. Uh, It has some nice fruity tones to it that I'm actually pretty excited about. Yeah, me too. I guess we might as well go ahead and take a sip. Oh, I like that a lot. Now, Josh has indicated to us that he will not be day drinking with us today. (laughs) Josh Josh said that he actually sampled this whiskey uh, maybe a few days ago before we recorded this podcast. I was hoping that he would have said that he did it this morning with his breakfast gin. But... (laughs) Yeah, you but know, Josh, once once you've had the breakfast gin, you got to kind of, you know, lay off the whiskey for at least a day. I feel Exactly. Like. <laughs> yeah, you got to let yourself drain out a little bit. So, Josh, what were your overall impressions of this whiskey? Yeah, so the context, I should probably give a little context in fairness to few here. Um, I've had this for a while, was looking forward to drinking it. And then just yesterday realized um, that, oh, I had not 
done that yet. And we were supposed to be recording film spotting that night. <laughs> so I thought I've got a couple of windows here. <laughs> uh, I, I could, you know, take some, have some with dinner and uh, really quickly here before I head over to record, I could have a little bit during recording or yeah, I could do the, the morning uh, option and drink here with you guys, which in my time zone is not yet launched. So I decided to bring it to our film spotting yes. recording. Yes. <laughs> I apologize in advance for the quality of that show. I'm not going to name which, which episode it is. But the real downside is I had to share it with Adam, and that, that kind uh, of sucked. Hey, that's um, okay. But, uh, yeah, so, so I do have some left. So I am smelling it here. Uh, I think the, um, those fruit notes that you mentioned, Brad, are, are correct. I can get that as well. And yeah, from, from what I remember, I think, I believe Adam added as we were tasting it, you know, he thought maybe some, a little bit of maple syrup of, mm-hmm. a, of a sense in that, which, which was good. So yeah, we both enjoyed it and uh, had to kind of uh, restrain ourselves so that we could finish the show. Yeah. Well, we would, we would respectfully ask that you don't include whiskey on your podcast because you might just put us out of business. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a one-time thing, I promise. No, I'm very excited to know that when I listen to the next film spotting episode, I I will know that the debates between you and Adam are actually being fueled by whiskey. That just makes it that much more intense. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It, it it only seems proper that your tasting for this episode was done while recording an episode of a podcast. Exactly. Yeah, I thought it fit too, so it all worked <laughs> out. So one thing that is pretty typical of younger bourbons is that you do get a lot of that oak smell and. People who drink a lot of wine and a lot of whiskey will will talk about the tannins as well. It's something that you get in younger bourbons more than ones that have been aging and picking up some of that char. And I definitely get a lot of the oak from the barrel on the nose and on the taste. I think Adam was right. There's a lot of maple on this. But I don't know that I would have pegged this to be a one-year bourbon. It tastes fairly mature for only being in the barrel for 12 months. Yeah, honestly, it leaves a lot of spice on the back of your mouth, on the back of your palate. And I, I, I really enjoy that. And it, like you said, Bob, it doesn't indicate a young bourbon to me. I'm glad you said that about the about the wine, Bob, because I was, I'm not an expert in whiskey at all. Um, and I was kind of, I was getting that sense too, you know, of the oak. And it was reminding me of, of kind of a, a fuller wine that that I've had. So yeah, that was one thing I appreciated about it as well. Well, we're going to go ahead and keep sipping on this as we continue our questions for Josh. Josh, I did want to get a little bit more kind of philosophical as we get into talking about the book here. You know, we were listening to an interview that you did on another podcast called uh, Things Above, and you had a really great segment on that podcast where you talked about the role of discernment in people watching films and how each person knows himself or herself and what they can and can't watch. And I found that to be a really fascinating point because I think it applies, you know, that podcast was more explicitly Christian in nature, but I think that applies whether you're a Christian or not. Everyone seems to have movies or topics or themes that they they may not be allowed or able to let themselves view. And I just wonder if you could speak to the importance of that for a viewer. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't really thought about it, how it might apply to someone who didn't identify as Christian. Maybe the corollary is, you know, a term that comes up when film discussion and discernment is talked about in wider circles these days is triggers. People want to know, you know, some of the content for a film because for personal reasons, it it might not, it would be unhealthy for them to watch. And maybe we can reverse engineer that backwards to think differently about how Christian discernment, especially in the culture wars of the 90s, was was definitely more about, is the content going to hurt me in some way? And how can I avoid that? Well, often that would reduce the content to very strict categories. Like if it has 10 swear words, you know, eight are fine. But if it has 10, I can't watch this. Things like that, yeah. which, are, which are really reductive. And I think the trigger idea is a little bit more holistic. When people use that, I think they're saying, this is particular to me this sort of storyline or narrative or imagery is going to, you know, put me in a bad emotional or psychological space. And I think there's a lot of respect for that for good reason these days. And I think we can transfer that to Christians who would say, listen, for my faith walk, for the the, sin, the things I struggle with, um, you know, the sin that may bedevil me, film with a certain type of content is not going to be healthy 
it's not going to be emotionally or psychologically or spiritually healthy for me. And I think that is completely legitimate and a good way of thinking about Christian discernment when it comes to film. Now, the danger will be when we slide back to that maybe posture of an earlier era is when we apply those personal levels of discernment to everyone and say, because I struggle with this, no one who would identify as a Christian should watch this film. It's got to be off limits. Uh, And some people will take it further and say it should be off limits and banned completely. And I think then we've taken our personal, personal discernment a bit too far. Yeah, Josh, and and following along that kind of same vein of thought, on the flip side of things, as a filmmaker, do you think that there's ever a point where you go too far and you you take a movie to a point where, man, maybe this movie shouldn't have been made because of how far it pushes into a certain trigger? Yeah, that's a good question. Um <sighs> I probably, I wouldn't want to speak for a filmmaker and having never really been in that position very, very briefly in college, I went to like a semester long uh, film program where filmmaking was one portion of it. Um, That's the only taste I've had about it. So I haven't really thought about what that would mean. I would guess you would hopefully do the same sort of discernment that a viewer would do and interrogate yourself and and say, you know, why am I putting this on the screen? Why am I exploring this idea? What are my motivations? What's my end goal? And, you know, apply this idea of discernment that way. But the tricky thing there, and it's tricky, you know, not only for filmmakers, but for viewers as well, is that we can deceive ourselves in our discernment. Sure. Um, you know, we can say as viewers, oh, I can handle that, or that's not, you know, that's not going to be bad for me emotionally or spiritually. And so I do like to always stress that discernment is done best in community. And that means, you know, something like the two of you are doing with a podcast where you're watching and working through these films together. It can be with a spouse, a partner, um, a small group of friends. It can be with a church film group. That's why I love hearing about church movie clubs is that that sort of discernment, it doesn't have to be the primary goal where you're, you're watching things to determine whether they're, um, you know, should be allowable, but it could be a factor of your community dynamic is that you can talk about where something might not be healthy for one member or another and, and hold each other accountable a little bit too, and say, this was a, you know, this was a really rough film. What, what did you get out of it? How would you defend it? So Josh, you're saying that Humans don't always have perfect self-awareness. Yeah, can you can you believe that? I, that's amazing! <laughs> wow. So, Josh, I do want to ask, kind of along those same lines, though. You know, I grew up just a total movie nerd, and I, you know, I grew up in the era where Roger Ebert was still at the height of his power in terms of influence over you know American public perception of movies. And I grew up wanting to be a movie critic, but something that I've kind of always struggled with is the idea that you know when you are a a movie critic or you're getting paid to review movies is there this sense that you feel compelled to watch everything or are there even some things for critics that are difficult to watch or that you just won't give in to watching yeah i did have that uh, reality as i said when i was working those seven years or so as a full-time movie critic where my job was to see everything that came to most theaters. Uh, This was for a suburban Chicago daily newspaper. So it wasn't quite so much the art house stuff, but if it was coming to a multiplex, I would be reviewing it. And I have to say the most challenging films of that time were when the Saw movies uh, were coming out. And um, this this is just a subgenre of horror, and I'm a horror fan generally, um, but involved a lot of just degradation of the human body, and that seemed to me to be the point of these films. Yeah. Um, really great film critic David Edelstein, I think he was writing for Slate at the time, coined the term torture porn uh, for this subgenre of movies, and that was really rough. I knew I would have to go see one of the sequels and write about it. Uh, and often it meant that I would spend a good portion of those films, like looking down at the theater floor. Was I not doing my job then? I guess you could argue that. Um, Maybe it was my job to watch everything and respond to it. Yeah, thankfully, it's it's not something I have to wrestle with quite as much now because uh, I'm more in a position of picking and choosing what I watch, 
And so if there are filmmakers that I, you know, have seen other films of theirs and really struggle with, I can choose not to write about or see those or talk about those. Um, if there's a movie that for some reason, for whatever my personal discernment might be, I think eh, probably not a good idea, I can try to avoid that as well. So it probably is more difficult for a critic whose responsibility is to see and weigh in on everything. Yeah. And along those lines, I'm curious, have you ever had anybody come to you and be like, Josh, like I saw this movie and I'm realizing that it wasn't like good for my soul. Like it's, it's sitting heavily in a bad way. Like what advice would you give to a person who maybe didn't realize what kind of triggers were going to be in a movie, watched it and, and is genuinely like disturbed by the content? Yeah. And I, I imagine like for some people, when I speak on college campuses, um, I'll also meet, you know, freshmen in particular who come up and say, um, I've, I've been raised in a home where we weren't allowed to watch movies or we were only allowed to watch this very specific genre of movies. And now I'm on campus and I'm watching what I want and I'm kind of having this, this internal struggle about it. So I can imagine a student, I've heard from students like that who will say, what do I do about that? And I think the important thing to remember there is if if you've done it in in good faith, um, you weren't necessarily looking for that content, you know, that we're all doing this under the umbrella of grace. And the wonderful thing about Christianity is that we've, uh, this isn't something to abuse, but we've already been covered in this way. Um, and in that sense, I should say, even if you've done, you know, watch something in bad faith, the good news is you're covered still. <laughs> so um, that's not a license. Um, you know, the scripture teaches that we shouldn't take that gift and use it as a license to do whatever we want. But when we recognize that we slipped up, we can move forward in hopes of choosing more wisely the next time, but also under the knowledge that um, we're living under grace. Well, I think this is a really good place to segue into talking about your book, Josh, Movies Are Prayers. You know, Brad and I have a few times on the podcast talked about our own personal backgrounds. We're both Christians and we both pastor churches. And I know, Josh, you're a Christian and this book was published through InterVarsity Press, uh, which is a Christian publisher. The book Movies Are Prayers, I find so interesting because I've seen so many books that have tried to, you know, they take like a uh, an approach to Christian theology where they find one theme like grace and then they'll say, okay, here are three or four movies where we can see grace in action. And it just becomes – Here's a movie that you can use as a sermon example. But what I love about what you did with this book is that you almost make the argument that the the filmmaking act or the movie itself is an expression of some emotion that a filmmaker is making to God. Can, can you go in a little bit on what the impetus for the book was and, and, and why you decided to frame it that way? Yeah, and I should clarify too right at the start that for most of the movies I discuss in movies are prayers – I'm not making the argument that this was necessarily intentional on the filmmaker's part. Right. Um, I'm very much um, looking at these films as entities of themselves that have been birthed not only from one particular filmmaker, but for movies, you know, often a cast and crew of hundreds um, and has become its own thing that in some wonderful way will echo a form of prayer that uh, people have experienced. So a prayer of praise, a prayer of confession, a prayer of lament. Um, there are movies that certainly function if you read them and look at details uh, from them in the same way, if you're someone who comes from a faith background and has experienced prayer in other contexts. So as far as you know, the, the why do something like this, I think I wanted to try, as you said, there are a lot of books that have been written about a theology of film, and I'm thankful for those. They did some very good work in moving the conversation from movies being something we need to judge or be afraid of to movies something we can actually engage with as people of faith. And so I had seen that good work being done, laying the groundwork for the argument, basically, is saying, yes, we can engage with movies, look at how rich they are, look at these Christian themes that can be found in them, we should be watching more movies. So I thought a next step might be, okay, what is a specific way to practice this sort of Christian film criticism? What might Christian film criticism look like in a very specific way? And so this is just one possibility. Movies are prayers. I'm not saying this is how a person of faith needs to watch all movies and identify every movie as what form of prayer it might be. But really, for me, it's just an example to say, hey, 
a Christian could um, write a piece of film criticism that's very much rooted in their faith, that looks at movies in a, a particular particular way that might might be interesting. So it was a lot of fun. It was it was an experiment in a lot of ways, uh, and I really enjoyed doing it. Yeah, it really gives you another lens through which you can view movies, whether or not you're a Christian. I think so, and I've heard some good responses to that effect. I mean, my the the main core audience I was I had in mind as I wrote was that Christian cinephile or at least Christian, you know pretty intense movie fan. But yeah, I, I have heard uh, from others who say I have no faith background, but I really enjoy looking at movies this way. And that's encouraging too, you know, a, a way of kind of widening that tent a little bit, broadening the conversation. And really it's no different than someone who might not engage in, let's say, feminist film criticism regularly, but they might read a book of feminist film criticism to see what it looks like to see movies that way. Um, I've done that. I, I read all sorts of critics. And one of the reasons I do that is because I can, for a brief time and in a certain way, look at movies through a different person's experience and eyes. And so I think Movies Our Prayers has done that for those who wouldn't um, say they're they're a believer of any kind. Yeah, and Josh, I'm actually really curious. We're we're gonna move away from the deep philosophy for a second. I'm curious. Were you watching a movie when you th when the thought popped into your head? Man, movies are kind of like prayers. And if so, what movie was it that you were watching? Yeah, it it wasn't. No, I wish I had that light bulb movie. Uh, <laughs> it really wasn't. This is an idea I had kind of flirted with back in my newspaper days, and then put in a bottom drawer, and came back to later after I began working at Think Christian and was more actively involved in theological reflection on pop culture. So it it was more of a general experience of watching a film and feeling like what I am experiencing right now feels awfully similar to when I do offer a prayer of praise, let's say, in uh, in church. And for example, I often throw out how watching Terrence Malick's The Tree of Life, that creation sequence, um, really echoes to me a psalm of praise, but also just to Genesis, you know, the first chapter of Genesis, um, the praise that we see in that we want to offer in response to the awe of the act of creation itself. So it was examples like that science fiction films I'd watch and this sense, this intense sense of yearning to know God better that many of my prayers consist of though I have the same feelings when I'm watching so many of these science fiction films from Solaris to Close Encounters of the Third Kind that are all about yearning to understand. Uh, so just having multiple experiences like that in these different forms of prayer, so confession and lament, made me realize, well, this is interesting that these two are echoing each other. What would it be like to then actively look for examples of this and, and see if there were enough of them that this is a project to pursue? Yeah, and it's so interesting to me because as I was reading, you know, the table of contents for your book, it almost felt like I was reading a description of the different type of psalms that we have in the Bible. You know, the psalms of lament and praise and ascent and, and all these different things. And it, it kind of brought this funny thought to my head of like, I wonder what kind of a filmmaker King David would have been if he lived in today's era. Yeah, a, a very eclectic one, because as you mentioned, <laughs> his his work, uh, his, his psalms, they really run the gamut from every, almost every human experience you could have. So, so yeah, that's, that is fascinating to think about. So Josh, what I really love about the book too, is that your, the kind of paradigm that you're using, it allows us to kind of, to examine movies that normally wouldn't be examined in what we would call like a quote unquote Christian book. You know, I, I think back to in the very first chapter, uh, in the prayers of praise, you talk about the movie Avatar. And I remember so much ink being spilled about Avatar from a Christian perspective because it kind of dabbles so much in Eastern religion and, you know, how much can a Christian really get out of this? But what I love about the approach that you take is, you know, I'm not I'm not so much interested in theologizing Avatar as I am, you know, what's the impulse behind it? And that it's James Cameron really putting the viewer in this place of awe that mirrors what a prayer of praise would look like. Yeah, I think for me, the reason the reason I approach it that way is a matter of posture. So it's interesting that you note um, there may have been some objections from Christian viewers about, you know, any sort of 
hints of Eastern religion that might be in the movie. Um, to me, that that suggests a posture where you're going into a film again with a litmus test. And on your list might be, maybe your primary question is, how does this movie, as I perceive it, compare to a Christian worldview? And if it does not completely align with a Christian worldview, then this movie I must oppose. If it does, I must endorse. Hmm. And that is, to me, that's a posture of sort of defensiveness and fearfulness uh, and the way I approach movies, just going back to I've, since I was a kid, I've just always loved movies. Uh, I approach it with more of a posture of appreciation. So yeah. I will watch a film and say, what did I enjoy about that movie? And just as a film critic in general, you know, that that could be anything that I might talk or write about to a mainstream audience. But at the same time, I'm thinking about it as a Christian. How did what I enjoy about this movie resonate with me. Now, there may be times where what's most interesting about film is the way it does divert from the Christian worldview that I hold. Um, I would say the better response to that is just to note those differences in a loving way rather than condemn the film for that, but just to say, hey, I see the world differently than this film does. But more often, I find that there are things to appreciate that resonate with my faith and that is what I want to focus on. So in the case of Avatar, it, it goes back to the tree of life and the Genesis uh, idea, really. I mean, we are created by a creative being. And one of the gifts we've been given is that we are also creators. So we have creativity woven inside us. And when I see a movie like Avatar that I found to be uh, really beautiful in its envisioning of this world, this other planet, um, I see it as an act of subcreation. You know, Cameron and the special effects artists he worked with um, building this entire new world as an expression of the creative gifts they've been given and an echo and a mirror of the true creation. So I think it's just a posture thing that leads me down that path rather than a different one. Well, if I could just pull back a little bit and kind of get the view from 30,000 feet of the book, what I really love at the end of the day about this book, as you said, is that it gives people one way of sort of understanding or reading films, and whether or not that they, they come from that background or they come from that lens. And Josh, I'm really curious because you've done so many you know, lectures and presentations in, in your roles. What does it look like where you're first teaching someone how to read a movie? We, we've really done in the first season of this podcast, you know, the whole conceit of our podcast is like, I grew up a movie nerd, Brad's my best friend, and he hasn't seen a lot of these classic movies. And we're kind of taking them from the point of view of Brad hasn't been exposed to like the weight and the history of appreciation of some of these movies. And it's been really refreshing to me to see both how Brad offers like really fresh takes, but also how he is looking at these movies from a really critical lens. And so I guess for our listeners, how would you offer maybe some introductory principles about how to go into a movie with a, a critical eye and, and how to read a film? I think if you're new to film in terms of wanting to really think about it and um, really dig into it, and it's fine, you know, if, if you if film wants to be sort of the escapist area of your life, uh, you know, that's fine too. But if you do want to start digging into film, the one thing I would suggest is to not worry about story or theme as much as maybe you've been used to. Not worry about the narrative. But instead, ask yourself while you're watching, what's interesting about what is actually in this frame right now? If a certain, not every frame of every movie is going to be arresting, but if you notice like, oh, this particular sequence, I'm kind of leaning forward a little bit. Ask yourself, not the plot reason, but what does this actual frame look like that might be causing that reaction in me. And then just go through, a, I don't want, you know, you don't want to have a checklist there on your lap, but think about in the back of your mind, keep things like sound design there or the use of color um, or even the editing. How often are you cutting from one image to the next? How might that be affecting you? And I say all that because I think the deeper level of film appreciation starts to come when you pay more attention to the craft. I'm not saying that's more important than theme or story, but part of becoming a cinephile is to restore that balance 
between plot and craft um, so that you're giving them equal consideration. And it's interesting, you know, to say you're a, you know, that you're a movie fan since you were a kid, Bob, and, and this has led to a deeper love because I find kids, most kids do this naturally. And it's almost like we kind of um, beat story preference into them. Um, as they get older, because I, I can remember from my one daughter in particular, when she was very young, if, if you would put her in front of like a Buster Keaton short or, uh, you know, a Miyazaki or something, often what she would comment on were formal elements. And maybe as kids get older and story becomes more important, they start to emphasize that, uh, just to make sense of the world. I guess that's natural. But yeah, it's always funny to me to see how a lot of kids pick up on these sort of formal details. And I think those are the ones you've got to um, bring to the forefront if you do really want to dig into film more. Yeah. And I, I'm going to kind of simplify what you just said on a very basic level, but you might be watching a movie with a little kid and they might go, wow, that's a really pretty tree. <laughs> and like us as adults would say like, yes, but the dialogue was very stilted <laughs> right there. But like if you if you so what you're saying is as a novice film critic, stop the movie at certain points and say, man, this like wide angle shot of, you know, an entire valley with mountains in the background. That is a really beautiful tree that's right in the middle of the valley. And I like that. It's it's visually pleasing. Is that kind of what you're saying? Absolutely. Yeah. And I, that's exactly the experience I've had, you know, when kids are, are watching movies. It's, and sometimes it's something like I've sort of registered, but it takes them to point it out and be like, oh yeah. And then you can ask the next question. You can ask the kid is, you know, why do you think that that tree is in there? Like, what is that? Uh, what, what's the point of that? What might the filmmakers creative decision have been? And I guess that's the correlation. That's when you start, uh, when you really get into movies, you start recognizing all the creative decisions that have been made and you honor those and ask why were they made and what does that add add to the film as a whole? So it's kind of the next level is recognizing the creative decisions, recognizing that this movie didn't just appear magically on your screen, but that a lot of artists put work into it. And when you start exploring that work in detail, you're honoring the art and you're going to enrich your own experience. Yeah, in a lot of ways, that for me probably has been my biggest growth is that whether it's a movie or a book or a piece of art or a YouTube clip, everything you see on the screen or read on the page was chosen to be there for a reason. And and with that, it, it comes with this awareness of, okay, well, why was it chosen to be there? And like you said, I think that's where you really start to advance in understanding the minds of filmmakers and the minds of you know, the art designer and the costume designer, like, why did they choose for that scene to happen in that way? Definitely. And there's, you know, there's always room to argue with that choice (laughs) and to say, (laughs) you know, I I didn't appreciate that choice or um, here's why I don't think it works with the film. But I think you'll find it the more you do that, you will appreciate more than you will criticize. And that's that's all for the good. Josh, we want you to participate in one more segment on our podcast today, and we're going to kind of go a little bit more fun to finish this out. I really appreciate you sticking with us on these sort of deeper, more philosophical questions. But Brad and I want to use you as an opportunity to settle some debates that we've had on this podcast. We we need we need arbitration. And so (laughs) sounds good. And we want you to be brutally honest. Don't try to justify us in any way and think, oh, well, maybe they were thinking about this. No, no, no. Be as brutal as. And as honest as you want to be. All right, you got it. So before we get into that, we are going to drink one more different kind of liquor. Now, we were sent the few bourbon by our friend, the Urban Bourbonist on Instagram, who is a Chicago-based bourbon steward. And he said, if I'm going to send you some bourbon, I also want to send you a bottle of this stuff that we make in Chicago, a liqueur called Malort. And it actually has a little, like, what's that called? An umlaut over the O. So I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. I, I believe it would be malut. Malut. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he sent us a bottle of this liqueur. And I, I told Josh in advance, I'm not going to make you suffer through this because I've heard nothing but negative things about, <laughs> about this liqueur. But as we uh, get our debate settled, Brad and I are going to be sipping on this. And Brad, we just poured it out. And I have to say... The the thing that it reminds me of, there's a cleaning product called Tarnex, oh boy. <laughs> where you, you dip like old coins in there and it restores them. And this smells exactly like that. <laughs> well, I don't have any old coins in my belly to clean, but I suppose we're going to drink this anyways. 
on the bottle, it actually says the description of the product is it has the aroma and flavor of an unusual botanical. So it doesn't actually compare it to anything in nature. It just says it's unusual. I feel like the name, what do you call this? Mal- Mal- Voldemort? <laughs> yeah, it's close enough. <laughs> the liquor that should not be named. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sir. Bottoms up. Cheers to you. Cheers to you. <laughs> oh, that's, oh my gosh. Oh, it starts out sweet and then it immediately goes sour. That's horrible. It's like, uh, it's like if you had a really bitter orange peel in your mouth. Oh, God. Oh, gosh. Uh, let's move on. <laughs> Bob, why did you make us do that? Urban bourbonist, I'm mad at you now. I take it uh, the little bottle that I did receive but haven't gotten to, I should just toss. Yeah, you need to, you need to give that to Adam and just tell him that it's great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <what> Brilliant. <laughs> Will do. All right, so here's the debate we want you to solve, Josh. We want you to pick the worst take in film and whiskey history. Hmm. Now, at the end of every one of our episodes, we end up scoring the film out of 10. Each of us give it a score. So it's a little bit different than what you guys do on film spotting. Uh, and so we want you to pick which one of our scores was the worst choice for a film. Okay. Do you want to do, do you want to do this blind so that, that I, I don't know who I'm choosing? I mean, I just oh, met actually, the both of you, so I, I can't really say I have a preference. <laughs> that's actually but... great. Yeah. Let's do it blind. Okay. So okay. here are the nominees. The first Star Wars film, A New Hope. At a 7 out of 10. Okay. The assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford was given a 4 out of 10. Mm. Now, that was a movie I remember you guys went back to on film spotting last year and, and did a revisit on that. We, ha- we have a leader. <laughs> <laughs> well, prepare yourself for this next one because Fight Club, David Fincher's classic that's celebrating its 20th anniversary, was given a 3.5 out of 10. Woo. And... E.T. the Extraterrestrial, Spielberg's 1982 classic, oh boy. a 6 out of 10. A 6? Okay, good. All right. <laughs> so, can, first of all, can I just get your reactions to, to all of those takes before you pick the winner here? These are my options. Yeah, those are the four. Okay. Um, you know, Star Wars is low, but that's that's fine. I, I, I One thing that does annoy me online is when I am berated for not loving something enough. So I think I'm probably going to let that one go. Um, Jesse James, that is pretty rough. Four out of ten. Uh, Fight Club, though, three and a half out of ten. I do think Fight Club is the better film. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, and then E.T. Now, E.T. Um, it is more of a travesty that E.T. only received six out of ten than the fact that Star Wars receives 7 out of 10. So I'm going to rank these for you. Let, okay, let, let's do that. <laughs> I love um, this. Okay. So Star Wars, yeah, that's that's uh, fourth. Um, you know, you should love it more, but fine if you don't. Um, let's see. Jesse James, I get it if that one doesn't really uh, hit with people. So it's it's an incorrect opinion, let's be clear. But um, But it's not horrible. E.T., I mean, E.T., this is, this, this personally kind of hurts, the E.T. slight, um, but, but it's not egregious. Again, if you don't like it as much as I do, <laughs> fine. Um, Fight Club is a problem. Fight, oh. Fight Club is a real issue here. Uh, I would have to ask, is, is this a recent review that, that Fight Club was given? Yeah, so I'll out myself. That was my score on Fight Club, and we Oosh. just did it at the end of last season. So it's only been about a month or so since we reviewed it. And so for me, the thing with fight club was that it's pretty clear what it's trying to go for in the satire elements. And I just thought for me, as controversial as that movie was that I didn't think it had quite the, the teeth or the bite that it needed to have. Fincher touched on a lot of different subjects, but I didn't think that he really narrowed in on any one of them enough to really provide a, a good enough critique on it. And so for me, that movie just has never worked. And I was so hoping when I listened to film spotting that Josh Larson would be in my corner. <laughs> Full disclosure, the thing that got me into film spotting, the very first episode I ever listened to was when you and Adam argued between American Hustle and The Wolf of Wall Street. Oh, and, yeah. And I was team Josh all the way because I didn't like The Wolf of Wall Street as well. And that's been like – the specter of that episode has has carried over for like six years on on film spotting. 
So well, I'm do, always I'm always like Josh, please be in my corner. <laughs> it's like Fight Club. Don't try to make up for your Fight Club sin now with, uh, with that comment. <laughs> um, your arguments against Fight Club are interesting because uh, similar things have been said about Joker, um, mm. which is obviously a, somewhat of a riff on Fight Club. I would think those arguments. I would say that those arguments are also um, misguided when it comes to Joker, which is a very good film. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to have to say it's. It's only been a month since you did Fight Club, but I think you're due for a revisit. All right. I will take that as a challenge, sir. <laughs> yeah, Josh, I just want you to know that as you were giving your description of these, Bob and I were sitting here silently like pointing at each other and laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can only hope that I offended you both. Yeah. So just to give you more background, Bob obviously gave Fight Club a three and a half. I was the one who gave Assassination of Jesse James by the Coward Robert Ford which we have agreed on the Film Whiskey podcast to only refer to by its full name. Yes, <laughs> uh, that's, I respect that. Um, I gave that a four. I was also the one who gave E.T. a six. So Bob gave mm. Star Wars a seven. And uh, yeah, I don't know if that tells you any more about Bob yeah. and I's movie preferences, but... I think, uh, uh, now I'm no good at math, but I think that balances out and I'm, I'm just going to have to say I'd like you equally, I think. We're okay with that. And yeah. as, uh, from what I've gathered, as long as we keep sending you whiskey, you're going to continue to like us too. Yeah, I assumed being on this podcast means I'm now like in a whiskey of the month. It just keeps coming, right? Oh, like, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, good. The good. mail order thing. If you yes. want to do an interview with us once a month, Josh, we would happily send you. <laughs> <laughs> Might have to up it to a case. Well, Josh, as we wrap up today, are there any uh, upcoming speaking engagements or anything you'd like to plug just for the next few weeks, the next month or two coming up for you? You know what I'll plug is it's not film, but it is a project that we're really excited about over at Think Christian. It's a new ebook we just um, put out, a theology of the office. For so another case, maybe not for everyone, but for those of your listeners who are interested in the faith and film connection, um, it's a group of six essays. I wrote the introductory essay, um, just looking back at the entire run of the office and um, how it might resonate with. Um, with the Christian faith. So that was a real blast to put together. It's been um, getting a lot of good reception. People are having a ton of fun with it, as you might imagine, and it's free. So if anyone is interested in that, they can go to thinkchristian.net slash the office um, and download it there. And if you're more of a podcast person, um, as I said, we did start a new Think Christian podcast as well that's digging into faith and pop culture about uh, every two weeks. So so check that out too. Yeah, Josh, as somebody who is currently watching through the TV show The Office for probably the fifth or sixth time, like just straight through, I, I am like vastly excited to read this ebook. Great. I think you'll enjoy it. Well, that has been Josh Larson, editor and film critic at Think Christian, host on Film Spotting and author of the book Movies Are Prayers. Josh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you both. This was fun. 